Hi, my name is Liz Castro. I'm a computer book author. Um, I've written books about HTML and about EPUB, about iPhoto, about Blogger, about Perl even. Um, I've been doing that for about 20 years. And um, in contrast with a lot of people who have spoken, it's, I'm just me. I don't have a business. I don't work for anybody else. I'm an independent um, writer. And so I hope that the things that I have to explain to you will be extrapolatable. Um, we'll see. Um, so my talk is called Zen and the Art of the Modular Ebook. Um, and the idea is, well, it's partly to tell you how I got to where I am, um, and maybe some of those lessons will be useful. Um, and partly to, it, it's an excuse for uh, my copious tweeting about Catalonia and sometimes about monarch butterflies um, and why those are important and how they led me to here. Um, the title, there's an asterisk in the title because um, I don't really know what Zen is. Um, I'm, uh, I have an idea about what it is, but I don't know if that's really real, and so I thought I'd better uh, asterisk it. It comes from, the, my, my idea about Zen is the, that everything is interconnected, and that um, it comes from this quote uh, from Douglas Adams, a book that he wrote called The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, and he's following this woman, he's a detective, and he's following this woman for 17 miles, and she finally stops her car. She's very frustrated, and he crashes into her. She says, what are you doing? Why are you crashing into me? And he says, well, I got lost. And he explains further, and he says, I'll read it to you. A few turnings later, and I was thoroughly lost. There's a school of thought which says that you should consult a map on these occasions. But to such people, I merely say, ha, what if you have no map to consult? What if your map is of the Dordogne? My own strategy is to find a car or the nearest equivalent, which looks as if it knows where it's going, and follow it. I rarely end up where I was intending to go, but I often end up somewhere that I needed to be. Um, so I want to tell you about my random cars. Um, the first one, I spent my junior year abroad at the University of California at Berkeley, here in the East Bay, um, and I had changed my major for the third time and to Spanish studies, and one of the few classes that fit into this major was Catalan, and I didn't know anything about Catalan, didn't know what it was, but I took this class, and it was completely transformative. Um, and then in the summer, a couple summers later, I found myself at the Catalan Summer University in Prada. This is a, a university that was set up during Franco's time so that Catalans could learn about their culture, um, which was prohibited in Spain, and about their language and about their history. And I went there with very little Catalan, but enough so that I could speak to people. And it was amazing. These people had um, such a sense of identity and of nation. And I was 22 and I had none of that. And I was just really inspired. And I decided that I had to move to Barcelona. Um, so that's what I did. Um, in 1987, I went to study sociolinguistics and bilingualism, why people speak two languages and when and how that works. Um, but instead, my random car, I found myself um, kind of because I got lost in an office building in front of a bulletin board that said, if you know the Macintosh and you're a native speaker of English, um, we have a job for you. And they did. And it was a computer company, one of the first computer companies that distributed Macintosh uh, software. And they wanted to localize uh, programs like uh, PageMaker into Spanish so that they could you know, sell more computers, basically. And so one of my first jobs was laying out the documentation for PageMaker 2.0. And we were using PageMaker 1.2 to do it. Um, Kind of basic. This is in 1987. And so for the next three years, I worked in the publications department. And this is how I learned what I know how to do today. Um, laying out manuals, that was the first part, learning the tools. And the second one was, um, was learning the tools and learning about documentation, learning about what works and what doesn't. I have read hundreds of pages of documents and of documentation of manuals, and I got an idea about what makes a computer book work and what's just marketing material, you know, lists of features, but they don't tell you what they're good for. Um, and then in about 1990, a guy from Apple Spain, um, a friend, Said, wanted me to work on a project with him, and he handed me a copy of the second edition of the Macintosh Bible, and he said, you know, there's some really good tips in here. We could use them for our magazine. So I called up the publisher, and I said, do you mind if we do that? And he said, no, and it's, that's fine. Um, would you like to uh, localize the Macintosh Bible into Spanish? I wasn't a publisher, so here's another random car. Oh, maybe I should be a publisher. Um, and so we did. This was a 500-page book. We had no money. Um, we kind of totally bootstrapped this book, and... Um, translated into Spanish, and it was 
a tiny market, very small market, maybe there were 50,000 Macs in Spain at the time, um, you know, most people were using Windows, and, um, and it, was, it had a different character as a book. It was very um, familiar. I don't know if you're familiar with the Macintosh Bible, but it, it, it talks to two. It's, it, it's on your side. It was not a book written by um, uh, a manufacturer. And, um, so for the, and, and it was great, and it worked. And for the next three years, another three years, that's what I did. I published computer books in Spanish about the Macintosh in Barcelona. Um, and so this was my formation into print publishing. And I remember spending hours poring over spreadsheets um, and trying to figure out where was that point where I could get the best price for a book and not have you know, 500 of them in my very small um, warehouse. It's also where I learned that books are really heavy. They're a pain to carry around. I lugged boxes of books a lot of places. Um, and that they're hard to ship, obviously, and that they're expensive to ship. Um, and so, this, so here's another place where I, I, I took a, a crazy turn and found myself doing something really interesting that I liked. Um, 1993, first I need water. In 1993, um, I went to the American Booksellers Association Conference in Miami, and I was watching Douglas Adams, who came into my life again, on stage with Ken Follett. Um, they're playing guitar. They were sort of an offshoot of the rock bottom remainders. Um, and I was talking to Ted Nace, who was the publisher at Peach Pit Press, and I, we had published a lot of their books in Spanish. And we were talking about the Macintosh Bible, and I said, you know, who are you going to get? to edit the next edition of the Mac Bible. And he said, well, we really want you to do it. And I was living in Barcelona, and he said, but you have to come back to the States. This was before um, you could just FTP files right and left. I mean, you could FTP them, but they would take forever. Um, and so there was, here's another thing that I had not planned on, but I decided it was the right moment to go that route. And so 1993, returned to Massachusetts, I worked on the Macintosh Bible, which was, mm, it was okay. Um, but by the spring, I was finishing up an update for the Mac Bible, which was a really interesting concept of how to um, update a book. And I got on the phone with Ted, and, and he said, and when we were, he was just about to hang up, and I said, wait, Ted, um, I really want to write my own book. What could I write a book about? And he said, well, uh, and he rattled off a whole list of programs that they were looking uh, for titles for, freehand and old programs, uh, Netscape, my eyes. Uh, lit up because Netscape was really big then. I thought, oh, I'll be a millionaire. Uh, and, and the last on the list was HTML. And uh, I said, you know, really, I'd love to do Netscape. And he said, okay, but you have to do the HTML first. So, okay, so I did. So I spent that summer, the summer of 94, writing this book on HTML, which I didn't really know what it was. Um, and as you can see, I then uh, ended up selling more than a million copies in lots and lots of languages. Um, seven editions now. It's been a really successful book. Um, and that the most exciting thing about HTML for me was that it opened up these, um, the possibilities for people to publish their ideas with no gatekeepers to the entire world. Um, and I absolutely loved that. Way back in the beginning, it might have been after the second edition, I started um, publishing a gallery of people's websites. And, um, and I loved looking through them. It was totally like taking random cars. There was a guy who took pictures of his children on the same bench in London, which is a thing that we do now in our family. And there were people who had, I don't know, stamp collections and whatever. You've all seen those. And they were just so inspiring, and I loved that. Um, but the problem with HTML for me as a book and as a writer was that um, I had to revise it uh, every so often. And Peach Pit was really generous and really patient with me in terms of letting me drag that out as much as I could. Um, but the first version of HTML, uh, the, fir the first edition of the book was about 150 pages. And by the fifth one, it was already 500 pages. And it would take me months and months and months to do it. Um, and I could hardly say no. This was, this is, you know, I was living on this book. It was great. Um, but I was really getting tired of it. And it was really hard for me. Uh, a golden limousine, if you like. Um, and by, uh, sort of towards the end of this period, uh, Pearson, who's Peach Pit's parent company, invited me to um, have a telephone chat about Evergreen Publishing, which is not a concept that I knew anything about. It was about how to keep books fresh and present. Um, and they really sort of planted a seed in my mind. How could I get out of this revision cycle? Um, and I didn't really figure it out for a while, but, but we'll get there. So 
in January of 2010, when Apple announced the iPad and they said they, iBooks was going to support EPUB, um, and that EPUB was based on HTML, and I didn't know that really very much about digital publishing, uh, I instantly knew that's what I wanted to write a book about. And so um, I begged PeachBit to give me a little more time and let me do this book first, um, and they did. And that was EPUB straight to the point. Um, and um, I've always packaged my books for Peach Pit. And that means that I do everything from the outline to all of the writing, to all of the examples, to all of the screenshots, to the layout, to the formatting, not in that order, um, to basically handing them a final file. And they would do a final read through and often cut important things. But really a lot, most of the book I, I did myself. And so when I was creating the EPUB file for my EPUB book, I said, you know, it seemed to me kind of crazy to hand them the book and not have some way to sell it myself since I had created the whole thing. And I asked them, I said, would you mind if I sold just the digital version, just the EPUB version of my book on my website? And my idea was just to sell some copies on the side, um, kind of because I could. Another kind of random car that would lead me to a new place. Um, and what happened was I kind of created a community um, that readers would write to me and I would write back to them and I've collected email addresses of lots and lots of people. I have more than 4,000 um, individual email addresses of people who have bought my books um, in the last two years only. Um, and then in 2010, uh, another thing happened, which was that Apple came out with a fixed layout format um, for EPUB, this ability to create kind of static pages that always stay the same, they're not reflowable. And um, PeachBit kindly offered to let me do a new edition of my EPUB Straight to the Point book, but that's exactly what I didn't want to do. Um, because the problem with revisions is that once you create an update, what, once you change, make a second edition of a book, the first edition is obsolete. And so I had another idea, um, which was creating an update, kind of in the style of the Macintosh Bible. Um, and I called it a mini guide instead of... Um, other terms that I could have used. And it was 21 pages, it was really short. Um, and my idea was to, I, I offered it as a free update to anybody who had bought my book, no matter where they bought it. So if they bought it from me, I sent it to them directly. And if they bought it from Amazon or Peach Pit or anywhere else, um, I just asked them to send me a receipt or some kind of, sometimes people would send me pictures, um, which I loved. And, um, and at the same time, I offered the book, the book, the mini guide, for sale for $4. And, I included with that a coupon for $4 off of the EPUB Straight to the Point book. And it was too complicated to, to offer that coupon for other vendors, but I could offer it on my website. Um, and so it was part marketing tool and part keeping the book alive and fresh. Um, and it was amazingly successful. People continued to ask me practically every day to send them copies of the fixed layout mini guide, which is woefully out of date, which I really need to update. Um, Probably, I, um, I haven't counted exactly because sometimes I, I lose track of all of the emails. But anyway, there's more than a thousand. Um, and what's interesting to me is that there's more even um, that I, that, uh, copies that I've sold of the fixed layout mini guide. And very few that have used the coupon for the book, um, which is curious. And um, then in February, no, in May, I created a new mini guide, uh, audio and video in EPUB, a very specific title. Um, it works in iPad, in, in iBooks only, um, and Nook, except that you can't actually self-publish books with video in them. Um, and at the very last second, I said, uh, I, and I decided not to follow the same system. Instead of giving it away, I charged five dollars for it, a very minimal amount, and it's done really well. Um, and these are the kinds of things that, these are the kind of books that would be impossible to create and to write. That nobody is going to um, contract me to write a book, a full size book about audio and video and EPUB. It's just, you know, it wouldn't sell enough copies. Um, and then, uh, we'll go back to Barcelona just a little bit. Um, I spent the, the year 2010, 2011 in Barcelona. Um, and one day I was wandering about on the web and noticed um, a collection of articles written by a guy named Matthew Tree. He's um, London based and he had put, his, had put his articles in English on his website, but they're kind of hard to navigate between. So I kind of just sort of randomly wrote him an email and said, would you be interested in me creating an ebook collection of your books? And he wrote me back kind of right away and he said, sure. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and 
then at the same time, kind of coincidentally, a Catalan publisher was translating his articles and pr uh, creating a print version of this very same book. And people started to ask if the English version would have a print version. Now, I had no intention of getting back into print publishing. I remembered lugging the books around. I wasn't going to do that. Plus, I was sort of between Barcelona and Massachusetts, and the, it just wouldn't work. Um, but it inspired me to think about um, print on demand and to investigate it and figure out how it worked. Um, and so. I ended up making a print version of Barcelona Catalonia, which is the book on the left. Um, and then a couple months later, I did a book uh, for a Catalan member of parliament called Tony Strubel. That's the What Catalans Want book. Um, both of them are in print and electronic editions, um, and they exist. And what they did, the, the place where they brought me to where I needed to be was, oh, I could do print editions of my books, too. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, the next two mini guides that I created, Read Aloud EPUB for iBooks, which couldn't be a more niche market if it tried. Um, and from InDesign CS 5.5 to EPUB and Kindle, um, I created both electronic and print editions of. Um, and they bring me to this question of what problems do modular eBooks solve? Um, the first one is updates. A modular ebook, by its nature, is short, and so it's much easier to get it out in a timely fashion. Um, it doesn't take that long, it doesn't take that many resources, and so um, when a new feature comes out or when something important um, appears, you can get a book out on it really quickly. Um, and then topics. I've talked about this a little bit, but the fact that you can have really, really specific topics um, that you might not be able to um, invest in in a, in a real book, but you can in, um, in a module of a book. And there's an interesting thing about um, having very specific topics that depend on a bigger book. You think, okay, the modular ebook is helping the big book stay fresh, but the big book also helps the module um, exist on its own. You don't have to rehash all of those topics again. Um, so, the, so, so that book can be independent of the main book. Maybe the person has learned how to write a content.opf file someplace else, or maybe they know how to zip and unzip, or whatever the other parts of EPUB are, and they only need that book for read aloud. Um, but if the person doesn't know that, then they can go back to the EPUB straight to the point, which is already written, and it doesn't need to be updated because they're complementary. Got it. Um, another topic that modular ebooks help to solve is the uh, issue of pricing. Uh, Michael Tamblin yesterday was talking about how the average book, uh, a price of an ebook is about three dollars. Um, and of course, computer books go for a lot more than that, but I still think that people's idea about ebooks is that they should be cheap. Um, and a module system means that you can charge less because it's a smaller book and it takes less time and effort and resources to create. Um, and a corollary of that is that it lends itself well to bundling. Um, so one of the things that I've done is I have uh, my EPUB book, which is $20, and then I have these four um, uh, uh, mini guides, and together they cost $24. Um, and then I, I throw in this book called Barcelona Beyond Gaudi, which is a JavaScript um, example. And so altogether that's $46, and I offer Oh, well, let me go back for a second. What I found was that my shopping cart um, has a minimum uh, fee of 75 cents. And so for a very small priced book, low priced book, that eats up way more than the percentage that they would charge me. So that, there's the random car that brought me to the idea of, oh, uh, if I bundle them all together, if somebody's going to buy all of those books together, I'd rather have them pay one price than I, ha than I pay, then I only have to, the service charge is much less, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and it turns out that people really like that idea. I give them um, a benefit on the, the price. They save uh, $6 or $7, whatever it is. Um, and so I've sold a lot of what I call the complete EPUB package. Um, and it has this added benefit that I can add things to it and I can take things away from it in a way that I could never do that with a regular book. Imagine adding chapters and taking chapters out. That wouldn't be good. But now, when I finally get to um, writing the EPUB 3 mini guide, which is about three quarters done, I promise I will do it, um, I will be able to add that into this package and it will make the whole bundle um, work better. I also have a JavaScript uh, book coming. I will do that, I promise. Um, and then one kind of inconvenience about um, modular ebooks is that people aren't really used to them. And so I see a lot of people, maybe not huge numbers, but a fair number of people who buy the InDesign CS 5.5 to EPUB and Kindle book 
without buying the EPUB book. And I don't know if they already have it or they already know EPUB, it's, it's possible, but I have it in my mind that they think that that's gonna be a complete book. And so I feel like I need to um, educate them more that that's really a module, it's not an update, it's not a, it's not a, a revision, it's not a new edition. Um, and so, in conclusion, um, I wanna tell you about my Monarch Butterfly book really quickly. Um, another distraction of mine, I have a field with, full of milkweed and butterflies come every August and um, I promise myself that I'm not going to spend every day out there looking at the butterflies, but actually I do. Uh, I take lots of pictures of them. Um, but now that's turned into um, an example from my next uh, JavaScript book, and um, I'm really excited about it. I put it up on the iBookstore on Friday. I sent out a mailing to um, all of those people in my database uh, Tuesday or so, and right now it's uh, number four or five, I'm not sure, on the science and nature list of the iBookstore. Um, so who knows where that road is going to take me, I'm not sure. Um, I think that's about it. I don't know if I have uh, three seconds for questions. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, I think that's it then. Thanks.